the new teachers. Oh, okay, please reconsider that career choice. Think about going into teaching. Um, second most important profession behind librarians right now. Okay. I would like to give a shout out to Dr. Kilmer, and I'd like us all to give her a huge round of applause. Big, bigger round of applause. Bigger, bigger. She has been doing this, I believe, for 25 years. And um, because of the vigilance of people like Dr. Kilmer, we are ready to face what is really a crisis right now. And if she had been doing this for 25 years, we would be caught flat-footed. So, so the people, including Dr. Kilmer, is this working right? Um, who, who have uh, really kept us um, on, uh, you know, paying attention to book banning, are really heroes at the moment. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, what's going on in Ohio. Some of you, how many of you have heard of House Bill 322, 327, 616? One, two people. And this is about, uh, about average when I have given a version of this talk. This is part of a national movement. In September 2020, President Trump issued an executive order saying that divisive or divisive concepts could not be taught about. There was a little clutter around UT at the time because this meant that most people who were doing any kind of professional development around racism, sexism, uh, cultural competence could no longer do that. Because if an organization hired them to give such a presentation, they would lose all of their federal funding. Okay, so shortly on the, the uh, heels of that, in December 2020, the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, how many of you have heard of it? Okay. It um, hosted a workshop by a man named Christopher Rufo, who's a brilliant strategist, and he figured out that three words would strike terror in the hearts of all Americans, or most Americans. Critical, that's scary, right? Race, yikes. Theory, ooh. Okay, so he very specifically and intentionally chose this somewhat obscure theory coming out of law, critical race theory. Have you heard of CRT? Have you heard people say CRT? Okay, and, and, and he operationalized that. And, and the first place he did that um, really publicly was at uh, this um, uh, summit hosted by Alec. Alec writes a lot of the legislation that gets rolled out then and submitted by representatives all across the United States. You know, if you're, how many of you are students? If I said, Here's a really good term paper. I'll email it to you. You change a few words and put your name on it and turn it in as yours. What would happen to you? You'd be out. Absolutely. That's one of the few grounds for absolute expulsion. Okay. Well, that's what Alec does. Okay. Much of the legislation that is passed nowadays is written by Alec, sent out to the 50 states to find a representative who will present it. Now, in this particular case, that's not exactly how it happened. Um, they did not uh, come up with the legislation. Instead, throughout 2021, we've seen about 20 uh, organizations who are writing this legislation that I'm about to talk about. How many of you have heard of Florida Don't Say Gay? More, right, okay. So how many of you would be appalled to know that that same thing is happening in Ohio? How many of you have heard that it's happening in Ohio? Ohio? About, okay, about half of, half of the half that had, uh, had known that. So if we look at Ohio, we have pending bills um, going back into 2021 to prohibit divisive concepts. Anyone give us a definition of divisive? What would that mean to you? Or did it isn't? You say divisive, I say divisive, <laughs> right? What's divisive or divisive? Okay, we'll get to that in a minute because um, 
my students last year said we needed to get that definition too. So House Bill 322 simply prohibited the teaching, instructing, and promoting an advocation of prohibited concepts, which um, centered on race and sex in pre-K through 12 schools. And you can go to the League of Women Voters if you just um, if you just Google League of Women Voters um, CRT Ohio. This will come up and, and it's a really good site for you to use. Um, so that, that was pretty eh, prohibitive, who cares, right? Just K through 12, probably shouldn't talk about sex in kindergarten anyway, right? <coughs> no big deal. So on the uh, heels of that is House Bill 327. It put a little bit more teeth into this and broadened it out a little bit. It would prohibit the teaching, instructing, promoting, and advocating of divisive concepts. We still, are you, you're not kidding me. You don't really know what divisive means, do you? Does anyone tell me? Would you raise your hand if you would have a hard time defining divisive? How many of you would have a hard time saying authoritatively this is a divisive topic? It would be hard to say authoritatively, wouldn't it? Because what makes something divisive? Rejected? Subjective. Subje it's subjective. It's subjective. It just means that we disagree, right? So um, House Bill says that we cannot instruct, promote, or advocate divisive concepts in pre-K or higher education. How many of you have had a conversation in the last week in one of your college classes where there was a little bit of disagreement? Oh, please, say yes. <laughs> it's going to be so sad if you say no. No disagreement. They're boring classes, if that's the case, right? What makes a class interesting? What makes you engage as a student if there's actually something to talk about, right? So this is scary for us. This is you guys that we're talking about, okay? And the violations are not as clear in higher education, but for K through 12 education, let's say I'm teaching ninth grade and I decide to use the 1619 project. If this bill passes and I teach from that, the first time Department of Education sends one of their administrators and slaps my hand, tells my principal, better get her to stop, tells the principal they're losing a small amount of state funding. Second time I do that, I teach chapter two. I get a, a mark put on my permanent record down at the state saying this is a, a problematic teacher. Principal loses a little bit more money. If it happens a third time, I lose my license that I spent four years paying for college to get, and that is the livelihood that supports my family. And my principal loses 100% of their funding. What happens to the school if they lose 100% of their state funding? It's gone. Because local funding isn't worth much, okay? Especially in, in, in urban areas, right? We, we have to have that state funding. So very, you know, at first it was House Bill 327. The substitute House Bill gave itself a really good name. The Promoting Education, Not Indoctrination Act. That sounds like something you want to get behind, doesn't it? I don't want indoctrination. That sounds scary. I want education. So, so we have to look at the optics here and how these are being put together. Now, several of you said that you had heard of Florida's Just Say Gay. Law, the way that that um, comes into Ohio is in House Bill 616. Okay, this is also a clip from um, the uh, uh, League of Women Voters Honesty and Education site. And um, 616 rolls together 327 and Florida's Don't Say Gay Bill. And, and if you think back to that diagram that showed all of the people writing legislation and circulating it, it's a mashup. Okay, so once again, you write a term paper and you plagiarize from two sources. Is it still played? You know, it's still not your work. People are just churning this stuff out without really thinking about it and um, without uh, really thinking about it. So they define divisive concepts. I'm asking you to put your critical thinking hat on here now. Um, in the bill in 327, and I think it's the same list in 616, a divisive concept. You must not teach that one nationality, color, ethnicity, race, sex, or religion is inherently superior to another. <laughs> now, then, does anyone really want us to teach 
that one group is inherently superior to another? No. Why did they put that one first? Ian? Everyone agrees. Everyone agrees. It's like, yes, of course, going back to that renaming. Education, not indoctrination. It would be indoctrination. It would be probably white supremacist, otherwise black supremacist, to do that. We don't want that. So we can all agree on that very easily. How many times when you see a list like this, let's be honest, do you read the first one and figure that pretty much sums it up? I do. I, this is a real hand. I'm not just, you know. So, so that first one is really tricky, okay? The second one, a divisive concept would be if I were to teach that the United States is fundamentally racist or sexist. What do you think? Do, do we sometimes want to talk about our, the foundation of our nation? Would there be argument about that? Would it be productive argument? Probably productive to look and to see. I mean, because basically, probably we have to all agree we've got some racism. Probably we have to all agree we've got some sexism. You look at, you know, median family wealth for a black family versus a white family, it's like two cents versus 60 cents, okay? Don't quote me on those numbers, I'm not a numbers person, okay? We look at um, women's pay, still about is it 72 cents on the dollar for men's. So, so, so we can look at the facts there and we can have good conversations about it, but not if this bill passes, okay? So we can go on, I don't have time to go through all of these. Um, one that really uh, um, comes out and I, I think it relates back to Jody Jameson's um, excellent presentation just a minute ago. Um, uh, in a roundabout way, just a second, I'll get there. An individual is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, consciously or unconsciously, by virtue of their nationality, color, ethnicity, race, sex, or religion. Even something like Jane Eyre, if you're bringing up in what ways does this take on racism, in what ways does it take on sexism, you've got the bad guy in the book, I can't remember his name, he, he's, he's inherently sexist, okay? And if somebody relates to that, they might feel bad. They might be, you know, uh, feel, feel like they, by connection, you know, are um, being uh, uh, put down. So, so how does this relate to banning books? These, these. It, it does and it doesn't. Um, so the most often specified in any of this is the 1619 project. Anyone hear of this? It was put out as a, a newspaper article or a, a, a magazine by the New York Times just after the George Floyd murder. Did anyone hear of George Floyd? Okay, so that was a really hot summer, right? This comes out with the thesis that the U.S. didn't start in 1776. The U.S. started in 1619 with the arrival of the first slave ship. That's interesting, isn't it? We're thinking about possibly controversial once you start talking about what's the start date for something, right? Who was there first? Okay. So, so it came out. This was the impetus for um, then President Trump's executive order in September 2020 that we talked about and the impetus then for this wave of legislation. Um, uh, but then we go to, to children's books and, and you know, we have, I don't know how many of you were here, but a wonderful presentation by Aya Khalil a few, about an hour ago on her children's book, which has been banned, okay? You know, about a, a little Egyptian girl going to school. How divisive is that? Pretty divisive that you're letting little Egyptian American girls in the school. So her book got banned. Okay. Um, others that, that get named um, Ruby Bridges Goes to School, My True Story. This was a scholastic book. You are of the age of the scholastic book fair, any of you? How many of you saw this at your scholastic book fair? Or uh, this is a Penguin Young Reader. So, so these are mainstream, right? Um, 
Moody Bridge's that ban, the reason given was that it was not sufficiently redemptive of the white people. That in the end of the story, it should have shown the white people were pretty good after all. Well, you know, we'll, we could talk about that. It would be interesting for discussion. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the March on Washington. Uh, it has been banned because it will inflict emotional trauma. Okay, so did, have any of you read either of these when you were little? No, no, you have. Okay, good. Um, more common, we think of books like Beloved as being um, banned in Texas. Beloved is one of 850 books that a senator has just called to be reviewed. There are 850 books, most of which are written by members of the LGBTQ community or people of color. And um, so we're looking to ban those now. Banning a book can get a good attention and raise sales, but for librarians and for schools, and especially for a big for-profit company like Scholastic, if Texas and 36 other states ban Ruby Bridges, do you think Scholastic is going to keep bringing it to your book fair? No, they're not going to touch it. And so this takes us to the chilling conversations part. Um, even the hint that you might get in trouble is enough to um, chill a conversation. So Dr. Barbara Mann gave a wonderful presentation. I hope you all watched the video of it if you weren't here, um, talking about how it's, uh, it's forbidden <laughs> to talk about genocide of indigenous Americans. Okay, um, so this is relevant. This is um, a story that one of my students last fall had been planning to teach in her student teaching. She was going to teach The Flowers by Alice Walker. It's a story about a young girl out in the meadow at the end of summer, steps down into the face of a man who had been lynched decades before. Okay, So she comes into class one day and she says, you know, my cooperating teacher just got called into the principal's office. She was teaching a short story by an indigenous author, not even about genocide, not about lynching, by an indigenous author. And a parent called and said, the teacher is teaching CRT. Does that even make sense? No. The teacher didn't get in trouble. The principal supported her. However, again, once these laws go into effect, and I'm going to switch to saying when they go into effect, because the way we're going right now, they will. Okay? They will go into effect because they've got the votes. All right? So vote. Find out who's going to vote for them. Vote for the other people, right? Okay? Unless you think it's a good idea, in which case you should find out who's supporting them and vote for them. And that's there are arguments on either side. And we can still have those arguments because these bills haven't passed yet. That's the only reason. But so the teacher had gotten called into the principal's office and um, uh, did, nothing really happened. But just that fear of you don't really want to have to go to the principal's office, even if you're a teacher. I've been called into the dean's office only once, and it was unpleasant. Okay. And I, I for some reason I was there. Not going to that. Um, anyway, so my student, uh, I don't remember what story she taught, but she certainly did not teach The Flowers by Alice Walker. That's what we mean by chilling conversation. Well, okay, she would have gotten in trouble or not. So last two weeks ago, second week of classes, in Introduction to Education, we read this book as one of our first. The white folks who, who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too. And uh, we had a wonderful discussion of it. Okay, And at the end I said, so you think that this book should be taught in intro to education here at UT. And the student could barely wait to get her, her hand up and she said, I could not believe that we were allowed to read this. Listen to those words. This is a direct quote, that we were allowed to read this. So this legislation has not passed, right? But it's already trickling down or bubbling up you know, the legislation is based on public belief. The legislation will reinforce public belief. And I mean, this is a pretty, uh, we don't have time to go into how tame this book is. But, um, and, and, and then once she said that, about five or six other people in class said the same thing. 
So their response of education associations, the OEA has sent out an action alert, okay? Um, the Ohio Education Association, the o, um, OT, o, OFT, Ohio Federation of Teachers, um, is, is very active in lobbying. I don't have a slide for them, but um, they have been very active in lobbying it, and, and it's from their research and I'm sorry, they're lobbying against it. I, let me make sure I say that. Um, the OFT is very much against it. Um, I have not heard any teachers groups come out in favor of it because it will just make their lives hell. All right, because you never know what's divisive until, until you get called into the principal's office and the Department of Education is there. So take action. We found out last fall when we were talking about this in that in that class that um and you know that the student who was going to teach alice walker's the flowers she had 23 classmates in that class they were all in student placements none of their cooperating teachers knew of these bills okay and they were pretty new then so so my my students said we're gonna we're gonna have a, a forum and we had a forum just down the hall here in the in the auditorium a hundred people came a hundred people tuned in it was a big deal um, they did a great job. A couple of things that are interesting. Uh, they were very glad, or let me say, when we sent out the press release, this was not me as a faculty member stealing their ideas and putting my name on it. They were afraid to put their name on it because they're going to be on the job market, chilling conversation, right? Um, they were very glad it was still in the pandemic. Uh, here is our host. He gave his first name. He kept his mask on for the Channel 13 um, interview. Of course, we were outside, it wasn't for the pandemic. Why would he keep his mask on? So, I mean, this is this is horrible that, that these students would be afraid to put their name in their faces. I'm getting teared up. Okay, it, it's just, it's a terrible thing, right? Um, so this is what we're talking about with chilling conversations. Uh, the same guy who did the um, interview, I, I won't tell his name. We had, we had big names. We had somebody from the Ohio Federation of Teachers, um, Daryl Johnson. Sean Nelson is the lawyer for Toledo Public Schools. And he said, this will be a disaster. How do you operationalize this? And he also said, of course, it's a violation of the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Um, Robin Lewis was the only student who would speak because she was a psychology student, not an education student. She wasn't going to be you know, shopping for a job in education. And she did a brilliant job. Sheena Barnes is um, one of our, our youngest and the only, I believe she is the only African-American openly um, LGBTQ school board member in the state of Ohio. So she was a speaker. Um, the kids did a great job. The kids, they're not kids, they were young adults. Um, but, you know, making this a little bit light, divisive is, according to Cambridge, something that causes great and sometimes unfriendly disagreement, okay? Uh, so, so they had a great touch to it. We followed this up in spring, and here you see we've got sort of a mix, and, and they're inside, and that's part of the reason um, that they're uh, uh, wearing masks or not wearing masks. Um, the students in that class uh, came up with this idea. They came up with a, a petition on change.org, which was mostly an educational tool, okay? Um, they, got, they got like 600 signatures they tabled in the student union. And then what they were doing with that, they were getting ready to go to Toledo's Democracy Day, which is a um, legally mandated event every spring. You should go to it. Um, it's really interesting. Um, so they uh, advertised that UT for UT students to go. They put up an information table and they presented uh, an argument saying, you guys need to know, we all need to know about House Bill 327 we were concerned with. They presented that argument. Um, she presented her own paper. She was the only one who got a laugh and applause, okay? So I, at the whole day that we were there, we did a, a terrific job, such a terrific job that council member Sandra McPherson um, said from the podium, she said, you should draft this as a resolution for us to introduce the city council. And so that's what we did. And uh, uh, council members uh, McPherson and um, Nick Comives um, have, have really been helping us with this. We took their talk. We looked and saw how, gosh, what does a resolution look like? So we looked one up. We used the format, where S, where S, where S, where S, okay? Um, they laid out 
you know, why, why this is harmful, including that um, it's, you know, a uh, attack on freedom of speech, but also that if a student experienced or witnessed a racism or a hate crime, the teacher would be forbidden to lead class discussion about that. You know, if a kid were from an LGBTQ family, a teacher would feel chilled about even acknowledging that. And so they, in their draft, said resolved that the Toledo City Council advocate for teacher students to be above stated values, which are core democratic values of cultural pluralism, participation, and freedom of speech, and that they officially oppose these House bills. And Council Member Comex is expected to introduce this to City Council next week. So go out there and in the tradition of UT's book band, hi.